You're listening to Making a Living Show. I'm Roby Levy. Who are you and what do you make for a living? Well, thanks for asking. <laughs> uh, my name is Jonas Chernick, and uh, I make movies for a living. Making movies for a living is a tough thing to do. It is a tough thing to do, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's complicated. Uh, first and foremost, I'm an actor. So I, I, I self-identify as an actor. <laughs> <laughs> so for much of my life, I'm acting in other people's movies, TV shows, web series, plays. And at, at some point in my uh, 20s, I, I got tired of waiting for the my agent to call. I didn't like the idea that my my creativity and my my work was beholden to somebody to other people to decide that I could. So I so in my off time, I started just writing screenplays, and you know I've always been into creative writing and considered myself a bit of a storyteller. So nurturing that that turned into one of those got got made and it was very exciting and it was very successful and then i realized well i can actually make them myself that's called producing that's what the producer does um and uh and so i i started i ventured down this path of learning how to produce films and get my own stories that i've told up on the screen with me as the actor and that was always the impetus i've never produced anything that I didn't write and and star in. That's pretty unique in and of itself because, you know, just to say, to, just, just to turn around and say, well, I'm an actor who needs a project, so I'm going to write it. And then I'm a writer yeah. who needs to get that project made, so I'm going to produce it. It's not like you can just turn around and say, I'm a writer and therefore generate a script. You have to be pretty good at it. You have to have started somewhere. And, and then to turn around and actually produce it, you need to know a hell of a lot about things like finance and you need connections and you need to know people and know the landscape of something. How did you get started with all of this? Like, take me back to acting. Where did you even learn to act? I mean, take, take it right back to seven, eight, nine years old, and I'm doing plays in my living room. And I remember we'd have family dinners. Uh, we'd have, like, family uncles and cousins over. And I would run off, grab a cousin and run up to my room and, and, and create a story, a puppet show, a play. And then after dinner, I'd get everyone to sit down and we'd perform, I'd perform for them. And eventually my mom just got sick of that and was like, <laughs> you, can, you can do that on Saturday afternoon at the acting school for kids. And so she enrolled me in, in this uh, sort of after school weekend acting program in Winnipeg where I grew up. And it was great. I was, it, it was a great outlet for me from ages seven to like 17, I think. I, I was just there whenever I wasn't at home. Uh, I was at this acting place uh, after school hours and on weekends and, and, and acting in plays. And, so that got the acting going. And then that led into university where I studied theater and I met, met like-minded artists and we created, we started a theater troupe and we did fringe festival productions and we created our own shows and had some success and we were good at it. And I felt confident and it started to really fill in this creative identity. And, and from there, um, Around that time, in the late 90s, Winnipeg was this booming film and TV scene where all these productions were coming and filming there, and they needed to hire local actors to play the smaller parts. But there was no film and TV acting community, so they would go into the theater community and just try to find actors and teach us kind of how to do it. And so I started just being drawn onto film sets, which I just... I was a huge movie buff. So it was just amazing being on these film sets and playing small parts and, you know, a scene here, a scene there, but enough that I started to get experience acting in front of the camera and could put together a little bit of a, what we call a demo reel. So I could go to move to Toronto when I was 27 and get an agent. Again, even sort of going from, from stage to film. I mean, like from, from, from having a troupe on a fringe stage is a hell of a lot different than walking onto set and knowing anything what to do. Like, how did you kind of get acclimated to that world? Trial by error. I mean, I, I remember the, fir the first time uh, I was on a film set. I had no idea what I was doing. And I was essentially doing theater acting in front of the camera, you know, and it, it takes a, it takes a, a, a gentle, but firm director to pull you aside and say, Hey, so what you're doing is stage acting and you're enunciating and you're speaking in an unusually loud Talking voice to the and, back of the room. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nobody like, we don't need the grip a guy, a lighting guy at the back of the room to hear you. There's a mic like hidden under your lapel. And so it was, it was really just being, and I was really interested in it. And I, I started to really notice the difference between uh, on cam film acting and stage acting. And, and I, I, I studied it. So I started reading books about it. And, and uh, once I got to Toronto, I started taking classes on it just to learn the distinction between the two. And, and, and really it was just, I made a lot, I mean, if you 
you, you would never watch them. But if you were if you were unfortunate enough to see <laughs> the, the bad t- TV movies that I did, you know, in the late nineties, early aughts, uh, where I have a scene here, a scene there, they're awful. I'm awful. But it, in watching them and seeing, oh my God, what am I doing? I'm I'm just I'm telegraphing my emotion through through. I I, I need to rein it in, rein it in, rein it in. And that continues to be my process of tr- trying to find the right <laughs> balance of all that. But it's but kind of like it, a it trombone. Really it. Like, where am I supposed to be? Where am yeah, I supposed exactly, to just sliding? Exactly. Yeah. 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 And, and you figure, you figure it out as you move, as you move through it. Well, and what was sort of a, a, a big moment for you? I mean, it's, it's one thing to have some bit roles. There's lots of people who only do bit roles and maybe they lose the flavor for it all. And they just, the taste for it. And they decide that's it for me, or they never actually progress beyond, but like, did somebody find you? Did you get a, a bit of a role, a big break? Yeah, I did get a big break. Uh, and it all happened just through my own sort of passion. There, there was a, uh, a friend of mine was, was, was helping cast a short film in Winnipeg. And he, he said to me, Hey, would you, you know, you're an actor. Would you like to, to re- audition for this short film? And I said, Oh, of course I'd love to be in a short film. And I, I auditioned and I, and I really connected with the director of the short film. He was an artsy guy, uh, traveled the world and got been to film school in various countries and was making his sort of second short film. And he cast me in the lead role of it. And it was an amazing experience shooting this thing for a week. And he and I just, it was like the meeting of the creative minds. We really clicked. And after we finished the short film, he sat me down and said, so I'm, I'm ready to start working on my first feature film. And I would love you to uh, be involved. I, I want to. I want to write it with the actors. I want to improvise it. I. He had this whole plan for how he was going to write his movie, and it had to do with actors, kind of creating characters and following leads, and just sort of seeing where the story goes. And we spent uh, two years developing this story, this feature film. And then he and his producing partner went out, and they raised money. They they raised half a million bucks. And we filmed this movie in Winnipeg in 1999 with all the, my actor friends. And it was this glorious experience where I was the lead in a film. Now, I didn't think anything would come of it. I, I assumed it's a little art film by a guy in Winnipeg. And, but the experience was incredible. And I learned a lot about producing, watching them and asking questions. And then miraculously, that movie got invited to screen at TIFF, the Toronto International Film Festival which was just this dream come true. I had just moved to Toronto and TIFF was this like untouchable golden thing that I one day hoped to. And suddenly I'm the lead in a movie that's playing at TIFF. And the movie was very successful at TIFF, got great reviews. It got sold. It won an award. And that was like really a launching pad for, for most of the careers of people involved in that movie. And what's this movie called? It's called Inertia. And it was on, you know, it was on Crave, formerly the movie network for a while. And and it, but it was this was pre digital age, so two, year two thousand two thousand and one. Um, you, you know, the only way you could see it was a thirty five millimeter print running through a projector. We have we have since done a digital uh, transfer, and so someday uh, soon maybe you'll see it on iTunes or something. Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of laughing because you know before pre two thousand. Anybody that was shooting anything was shooting it on film, and if you had, a, if, you know, if you had a couple of bucks, it was like sixteen and, and, and sixteen mil, and if you had more than a couple of bucks, you know, and just barely, you were shooting thirty five. But like, it also took forever to cut it. You never saw the rushes. Like, you couldn't afford to get those things happening. You couldn't see the film you were making. Whereas now we live in a world where you know you can replay it in your camera, and then you can even replay it with the effects put onto it and all this temp stuff, temp color and temp everything. It always makes me laugh to think how bloody hard it was to actually put a movie together in such long pieces and pieces that were just, you know, you, you didn't see your cut for, you didn't even see your film developed for like months. Yeah. And then to cut, to edit the film, you literally had a, 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 <laughs> like a, like a scissor, like a blade yeah. that cut, cut through the celluloid and then you'd splice the next scene to get, like it was all done manually. Like it's, it's mind boggling to think that it was only a few years ago. Yeah. When you needed light, you rub two sticks together as fast as you could <laughs> just to cause exactly. a spark. It was all with friction. Honestly, we sound like we're caving, but no, it's, it's, it, it is funny that the quantum leap that it's taken over the, uh, yeah. you know, over the last like, 20 years, it's, it's night and day. And now everybody's shooting a camera. So it's like, it, it, even in terms of that, it's funny to see people shooting cameras, making stuff, but they're not necessarily making movies. They're making small stuff. They're making stuff that's more attainable and, and easier to, to, you know, to, to, to put together. What goes into making a movie? I mean, how did you, you saw it, you saw it back then, you've seen it today. Is it the same mechanics that are going into it? Is it the same money that's needed and the same people? I mean, 
Yes, I, the basics of it are the same. The the specifics are all different. So where you get the money, how you get the money. I mean, these are this is constantly evolving. But but it's the same basic idea. It's that you have a story. The best way to tell that story is in a ninety to one hundred and twenty minute um, feature length film. And you just write it and write the heck out of it and keep writing it until it's undeniably great. And then you go out in the world and try to enroll and enlist people in your passionate vision and try to convince people to get on board with it. And the first time I, I, I went out to do that, which was about 10 years after I had made that first film, it took about 10 years for me to, 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 to get the gumption up to say, oh, I think I'm ready now to go out and try and, and raise money to make a film. I did not. I I wasn't confident that I would be able to do it, and I didn't have. I didn't have. There's no roadmap. There's no, uh, uh, how, you know, how to make an indie film for dummies. I mean, there might be. There probably is actually, but I didn't read it. So so it was really just trying to make my own way. And and luckily, I had several mentors in the industry, including the director of that first film, Sean Garrity, who I've made several films with since, who who had been through it and could answer questions and offer direction. But I kind of found my own way, and the way that I make films and raise money to make my films and get them made is very different from the way sean does it and from all my other friends who are producers everybody kind of has their own we're like snowflakes we're all <laughs> not none, none two of us are the same does the story actually dictate in any which way how the thing is going to come together i i think so i i think so i mean if you have a, a an alien spaceship movie with creatures and you, you can't you know, make it for one hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars. So, so I think it, it dictates the budget level or the scope. But I, but here's a great example. I I had a, a, a film, a script that I was developing for many, many, many years, convinced that it was going to be a five to eight million dollar movie, and I just couldn't put the money together. So I put it on the shelf, and now we're shooting it in January for you know a few hundred thousand. I mean, it's it, it, you can still you can find a way to do it. Um, but, but for me, I'm looking for ideas for movies. I I'm not interested in making short films or web series right now anyway, or writing a novel, uh, every story that I, that comes into my mind and that I develop and stick with and try to figure out it, they're all feature films. That seems to be the medium that I'm, that I'm the only medium that I'm really interested in t- telling, telling stories in. What, what is it about feature film that attracts you so much? The magic uh, it's magic I, I when i was a kid I, my parents would i'd go to the they took me to a lot of theater and they took me to a lot of cinema to a lot of film the theater was fun i enjoyed it but there was something about the experience of seeing these movies that i i wondered is everyone feeling what i'm feeling i it from a very young age i can remember the earliest movies i saw in a theater four or five six years old just being completely transported and and feeling the magic of that uh, and, and, and and all the way through my adolescence, just continually gravitating to the point that you know, I was a nerdy kid. And every weekend, what would I do on my Saturdays and Sunday afternoons when I wasn't in my drama class? I was taking the bus downtown by myself at age nine, eight, nine, ten, and and going and seeing a matinee and maybe two each day, and and really just wanting to consume as much film as I could. And that was before VH and VCRs, before you could watch a movie in your house. You caught what was on TV or you went to the theaters and I just couldn't get enough of it. And I wanted to be a part of that in some way. You'd mentioned that you're always on the lookout for ideas. Where are you looking Mm -hmm. for them? Where are you finding them or where are you generating them from? I suppose. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost, it's hard to answer because I don't, I'm not actively looking. I'm not, I'm not spending the day with a notebook sitting in a park thinking of ideas. I'm not watching people and, thinking wondering oh is there a movie idea out here so the the ideas ideas don't come to me in, in a very bountiful uh or a plentiful quantity they there it's very few and far between i so i get about one good idea a year and and i know it's good because it sticks around and it continues to percolate and bubble in my in my mind and i i stick with it and i start to really think i can't stop thinking about the characters and start fleshing it out but they don't. They're, I'm not looking for them. They're just. They just kind of um, find me in in uh, un, really unexpected places. And you know, or or I'll say I'm really interested in time travel. I really enjoy time travel films. 
I'd love to write a time travel film and make a time travel film. I don't have an idea though. So that's sitting with me for years until, you know, one day I just come up with the idea for my time travel movie or, and, and so, but it's not like I'm, I'm sitting actively trying to squeeze these ideas out of the ether. Um, they just fall, seem to fall onto me. And, are you ever worried that they won't fall? Like, I mean, when you only have one idea a year, are you worried, you know, shit, we're getting to the end of the year here. I haven't had my, 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 my idea fall and hit me on the head like an apple. Like do you, yeah. do, you do you get worried? You're not going to, you're going to run out. Very, very much so. <laughs> and uh, to the point that just in the last year or two, really since the pandemic started, I've opened it up to maybe I need to look at other people's stories as well. And, and for the first time, I'm kind of looking at a couple of other people's scripts and ideas and trying to get excited about them. And if I can get excited enough about them, I could see myself taking that and working with them and still being an actor and still producing, but it's their story, helping them tell their story. So far, I haven't found one yet that I get as invested in as the idea that's born from me. Um, but, but I'm open to it now because yeah, I don't know if, uh, I could go, I could go years without getting that one idea. I think that's one of those things that in and of itself becomes a self fulfilling prophecy, right? Like you can get so concerned about creative block and being worried about whether or not you're going to have a quality idea, whether you're going to be able to actually put pellet forward that you wind up sort of trashing everything along the way. Like maybe it's not good enough. It's not good enough. Why should I devote my time to it? But it, how are you finding yourself reviewing these other ideas that come in i mean are they coming in like here's a, here's a spec script here's something that i've got written or uh, here's an idea i want to throw past you and see if you like it let's let's develop it together like how are they coming to you um various different ways so i've, I've got a lot of colleagues and friends in the industry that are writers and so i'm you know i'm reading scripts all the time we have this community of writers who we give each other our scripts and say hey can you read it and give me feedback and give me notes and so i'm constantly reading scripts that way and i'm on the lookout there is there something that tweak something in me that makes me feel that this is personal or makes me feel like uh, I'm supposed to be a part of this or that I can help tell this story. Um, and so that's, that's been a, an avenue uh, for finding some, some things. And I, I, and then there's, you know, there's professional events. I just participated in a, a forum, a forum, a filmmaking forum at TIFF where I was presenting one of my projects to a whole bunch of people and saying, Hey, does anybody want to help? You know, can anyone help me make this one? And in response, all the other 25 producers with their projects were saying, hey, these are... And so I actually read one during that process that I just fell in love with. I thought, oh my gosh, this is great. I can really get involved with this. So there's different there's different avenues for me. I'm reading scripts all the time. When you're reading scripts, especially for friends who are writers, they've got an idea, they're passionate about it, and they send you their script, they want your, your input. What happens when your input is, this is bad? <laughs> or, you know, how do you deliver that kind of news? And, you know, I mean, how do they take it? I have to deliver that all the time. Uh, I mean, professionally and also just as a, as a friendly, um, as I said, as a support mechanism for colleagues, very few of the scripts that I read are good. Um, that's the nature of it. It's if they were all good, you know, it would be easy to make your films. It's really hard to write a good script. It's even harder to write a great script. And, you know, you get, I, I, I got, I've gotten better at it. So it, it's not so much, um, you know, this is terrible. You should quit writing. It's how can I be constructive? You know, what can I say that's going to be constructive here? So I've gotten, you know, I've gotten really good at, I think, breaking down why a script doesn't work. Cause it, it's like opening the engine of a car. You know what? I don't, I have no idea how a car works. I have no idea. I know what the pieces are called, but I have no idea how they work in tandem to make a car move. I, I understand to some degree how a script works and I understand what the pieces, what pieces need to be in place and how they need to work together to, to effectively tell a story. So I'm able to say, you know, constructively, I'm really feeling like I'm not connecting with this character. And, you know, I think here's maybe why, and here's some choices this character is making, or, you know, I, I, have you thought about the meaning of this and what you're trying to say here? Because it feels like maybe you're saying this, but then I feel like you're saying this. So I think it needs a little more clarity of vision. So it's really just about finding the cons what you can say to be constructive. Generally speaking, when I see a bad movie, when I see a bad TV show, but certainly when I see a bad movie, if I really think about it, it's because the characters aren't fully fleshed out, it seems. They're empty 
and it just seems like the movie is on autopilot and stuff's happening to the characters to make them react. How do you write something and make sure that the characters are making choices and that they're responsible, that their character is coming out or developing further in the context of the movie? Because people are more interesting than things that happen, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, you've actually hit the bullseye on my my number one philosophy as a writer or a story editor or as a producer is that the the nucleus of any good story in any media is a, a character who wants something. And in pursuit of that thing that they want, they come up against obstacles and they either get it or they don't, or the journey makes them change their mind and they realize they never wanted it all along, but what they really wanted was this. But it all stems from who is the character and what do they want? So that that's you. I mean, you asked the perfect question. And it's always where I start with when I'm also a professional story editor. So I help, I coach other writers with their you know professionally with their scripts and 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 it's always it almost always comes back to if something's not working, if a story's not working, if a movie's not working, it almost always comes back to that very core. Who is the character here? What do they want? And why do they want it so badly? And what happens if they don't? get it right and if you look at all of the great stories from the wizard of oz to star wars to raiders of the lost ark to snow white and the seven dwarfs and they could go on and on and on you will not find you'll be hard pressed to find a single classic movie or successful movie or great movie that where you can't very simply answer the question you know who indiana jones wants the lost ark of the covenant because if he doesn't get it, the Nazis will get it and they'll destroy the world. Yeah. So real simple. That's who do they want? Who are they? What do they want? Well, we've discussed who you are and we've discussed your love of film. I mean, from an early age and all the way through and your love of acting, and your love of storytelling. Is there an ultimate end goal? Is there a place you're trying to get something you're trying to achieve? No. <laughs> Great. Podcast <laughs> over. See you, no, kids. I, I, <laughs> There was for a long time. There was, and and uh, as a younger man, I had, I had very specific aspirations. I moved to LA. I was living in both LA and Toronto, and toggling two careers, and really, you know, thought I was chasing something that we traditionally are told we're supposed to be chasing when we are a act, young actor, or writer, or filmmaker, and 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 realized over the course of six or seven amazing years where I had a great experiences that what I really want is um, to be able to t tell these stories, tell my own stories on my terms when I want to tell them and without having to answer to anybody. So the movies that I make here in Canada, um, nobody's telling me how that I have to put Tom Cruise in them or they can't get made. Nobody's telling me that I, you know, have to cast their daughter in the lead or I get to tell the stories that I want to tell on the level that I want to tell them. So I'm living here. I'm making my own films. I have a family. I'm very, very satisfied with, you know, I have amazing, two amazing kids. I have an incredible partner and I'm telling my own stories and I'm acting in other people's. And I don't feel like I'm chasing anything at this point. I've also reached like, obviously I'm not, <laughs> I, I, I haven't won an Oscar uh, you know, I'm not, nobody knows who I am. I am not a celebrity by any means, except in certain pockets of Winnipeg, um, <laughs> where I'm the local boy who make it. But uh, so, so, but, but, you know, I've achieved so much that I'm proud of. I've traveled the world. I've gone to these film festivals all over the world. I have been lauded with awards I never imagined I would win. And, you know, I've worked in, in, in films and I've shot in Morocco and in Prague and just things that I dreamed of when I was that seven year old or eight year old going to the movies that I've done and they, they exceed my dreams. And so, you know, I'm not chasing an Oscar. I'm not chasing a Hollywood career. I'm very happy with what, with what I'm doing. You can go to these festivals and you can get awards and then you can also then turn around and the phone doesn't ring. They don't necessarily mean that you've achieved a certain success and therefore all of a sudden, you know, people are just dropping bags of cash and, and taking every idea you've got and making them into, into shows. There's still a grind to it. There's still, you still have to have the motivation to keep going. What motivates you to keep going? I mean, it, it, for me, it comes down to the hustle, the hustle. I, I'm always hustling. And 
And I had to ask myself why. And, and especially in the last two years, you know, March 2020, when the world pressed pause and suddenly nobody was making movies and nobody was hustling to get their movies made or competing for that, it all stopped for a little while. And I, I was okay with that. I was okay. And I sat back and spent a few months just sheltering in place with my kids and my family. I picked up an instrument. I learned a musical instrument. I, you know, cooked new things. And, and I was like, hey, you know what? Maybe I don't need to be pushing all the time. That lasted about eight weeks, nine <laughs> weeks. And then I was like, the itch, the itch to do more, to make. I, I'll put it in real simple terms. I like making stuff. That's it. I love making stuff. And I feel alive when I'm making stuff. And and uh, I could take a break, but it feels like, at least for now, I'm always going to come back to that itch, that that urgency of, I want to make something again. I want to make something again. The challenge of it, the the expression of it, the exploration of it, the, the amount that, I, the self-discovery of what I learned about myself and about the way I relate to people and the way I relate to storytelling each time. It's like a drug. I mean, it's really, it's it really fuels me and and gives me gives me joy. I mean, it gives me great joy. And then to see audiences responding to it, it was really hard to 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 think that I might have a film coming out when there wasn't film festivals, because I didn't want my films to come out on a virtual platform where I couldn't be in the room with the audience watching it. I want to see them reacting to it. I want to answer their questions after. I want to shake their hands and hug them afterwards. So I've held on to my newest film because I'm not ready to release it right now. I want to wait until film festivals are in person again. So all of that is what drives me. What about your partner and your kids? Anybody showing any interest in this crazy, wacky world? Are are, are they civilians or are they going to get into the uh, trenches with you? My wife is an, uh, a visual artist, so it's perfect because she's not in film, but she understands the artist's life. She understands the need to create. She understands the passion and the risk and the uh, sacrifice involved, which is just perfect. Um, I wouldn't want her to be <laughs> in film. That would be terrible. <laughs> My eldest daughter, who's almost 12, really is interested in it. It started off as like musical theater. She's interested in performance. Um, she's musical. She's a, she's an actor. She, she took an on camera, a film acting class just before the pandemic, because she started saying she wanted to uh, start auditioning for movies and stuff. And, um, I'm supportive of it because I've had a great run of it. My, my wife obviously, and wisely is cautious, uh, more cautious about it and wants to make sure it's all about the right things. But there's a creativity in, in the family, everybody, even my, and my youngest as well. She's, just wants to wanted to learn piano, so she took that on, and um, so I don't know. There could be there could be more a uh, couple of young filmmakers on the rise. There, we'll see. They love movies, so that's that's a, that's the that's where it starts. So outside of family, then who do you work with on a regular basis? I mean, you write, you act, and you produce, but you're not doing all this on your own. I mean, filmmaking is a big endeavor. Yeah. So creative partners, I have a bunch. Sean Garrity, uh, the gentleman who I talked about, who cast me in a short film, and then we made the film together that played at TIFF. We've made five films together, and we're about to make another one. We're shooting it in January. He's he's somebody we keep coming back together and doing stuff. Um, it's a, a director, writer named Jeremy Lalonde, who I've made uh, three films with, and I'm sure we'll, sorry, four films with, and I'm sure we'll make more as well. Uh, creative partner. But as far as producing, who do I produce the movies with? My my rule has been from the first movie on till till today, I will only produce a movie with a partner who is smarter, better, more experienced than me, who knows parts of the industry that I don't know, who understands stuff that I don't get. So uh, I, I've jumbled it up. There's, I've had a few different partners. I've learned so much from all of them. Um, but I like to I like to uh, the mentorship is important to me. So I want to be with working with somebody or partnering with somebody who I think is smarter than I am. I'm pretty smart, so that's actually very <laughs> difficult. But that is that is a very important thing is to actually find somebody who you know fills in the gaps where you don't where you're not strong. I mean, let's be fair; you can't be good at everything, and to navigate the financing of a feature film is no easy feat, especially in Canada where you actually need to wrangle every single different funding body in order to make anything. I mean, it literally, if you look at the credits of any show or any film, every single funding body is, has been lined up and gets their credit. And that's just because there isn't a ton of money to go around. 
you know, and so you need that kind of producing partner, generally speaking, someone who knows some some way around to navigate that. Well, sure. Um, it's incredibly difficult. There are creative ways to get you know, funding that aren't that don't involve Canadian government agencies. I you know I I haven't made one like that yet because I've I've just been you know lucky enough to be in, to get my foot in the door in the system to so much so that now I'm that producer that people look at my movies and go, Oh, look, he's had the support of all the government funds and he's pre-sold to the, he knows the networks. And so they're coming to me now, um, you know, which is nice. And and I'm happy to help whenever I can, but, but there's other ways to make a movie. Um, I you know I tried to, we, the, the pandemic movie I shot last September, it was going to be just, a uh, 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 independently financed. And then even though I was trying not to involve any of those, I found a way into one of them that I couldn't say no to. And so they're on the film, but that's boring business stuff though. The business is the, is, is the part that seems to be the mystery oftentimes for folks, mm. right? Like, I mean, good or bad, people know how to put pen to paper and good or bad people know how to turn in a role, but sometimes mm. they don't know how to actually get that funding body. How do I get that broadcaster involved? You know, that kind of a thing. I mean, making yeah. a sale at a, at a, at a festival, that's a hard thing to kind of navigate. I think a lot of people are putting together their films and I mean like shorts and things like that. There used to never be a place for them. They used to just be calling cards. Now you can actually put them up on things. You can make a couple of bucks on them, which means you actually can't just make them the way we all used to make them, which was, Hey, everybody come out for a weekend. Do me a favor. I'm going to shoot out this thing that I wrote and you're in it and you're in it and you're in it and you do the lights and you do the this. And nobody got paid and there was no money to get paid with. So it didn't matter. But now if you have somebody come out and help you out, you kind of need to sign contracts with them. You kind of need to make sure it's all taken care of because if you make five bucks on it, they're entitled to some of that five bucks. Yeah, yeah, it, it's a bit of a different, you're right, it's a bit of a different vibe. I, I think you can still make that the first film you talked about, like, the, you know, having your friends, I've seen them, they don't, they're not usually as competitive because they're not, they're typically people doing jobs that they maybe haven't done before and they're more learning experiences. But yeah, but let's not, let's not jump on that, you know, let's not, just brush it under the rug yet. Yeah, I think you can still make a film that way. <laughs> yeah. To be fair, I mean, I've made some stuff that way and it's turned out very well, but I have had to contend with some of the questions later on. Like there was some interest in a short that we made in that fashion. And rather than get into any sort of concerns about making all the five bucks with it, it wasn't like that. Somebody offered us five bucks. I said, you know, why don't you just take it, play it and don't worry about the five bucks and nobody needs to worry about you know, what piece of it you get just, just to be on the safe side, truthfully, because you don't want to piss anybody off your buddies, mm, you know, yeah, it's amazing sure. how quickly money can turn things on people. But Oh yeah. No, yeah, absolutely. As somebody who's making their own stuff, the responsibility is, you know, falls to you to market your stuff. And you've said before, you're a huge fan of social media. You love it. You're obviously very <laughs> adept at it and you just want to be on it all the time. Like you hate social media. It's boring. You don't like it. How do you promote your stuff? How do you get it out there? Uh, that's been, uh, that's been a trial and error too. It's like, I, 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 so far I'm yet to crack the nut of how do you get it out? You, you need, you need the support and assistance of, of, I think of some other entity to help you get the word out. So on my various films, it's been, there's been different, uh, different partners that I, that have assisted me with that. Um, my most successful film was successful internationally because we had a sales agent who saw it at TIFF and said, I want to sell this movie around the world. And we actually had a few come up to us and say, we had to pick the one we thought was the best. And sure enough, that company sold the movie all over the world. And I had very little to do with that. I, I tried to make something that would resonate with people that was true to myself. And I got, you know, I, things went well with that one. It hasn't gone that well with all the other ones. There's been a few of them that have done that. Um, I, I've kind of got my finger on it in Canada now. I know, I know enough people and companies in Canada that can help get to get the project. And my next, my next film is got, has pre-sold to CBC, so I know it's going to be on CBC. So that's great. And Hollywood Suite is a pay channel and Crave. So there are there are these places, and certainly in Canada, I know who to talk to. I know who to pitch my movie to. And how do I do it? Well, it's all about the product. If you make if you make an undeniably good movie, they're gonna they're they're going to buy it and they're going to show it to people. Um, it's when you make something that is um, maybe mediocre or or maybe didn't meet the heights that you were aiming for that you have to start really 
uh, hustling and pitching it and trying to convince, you know, take a shot on me, please put it out. You know, that's when it gets more complicated. The, the easiest answer is make something good or great. And, you know, it, it makes the path a lot easier. What, what would it take for social media to draw you in? You have a Twitter account. I don't even know how often you use it, but like, I'm assuming you just use it to like, hey, I got a, a film coming out. Come check it out. Or, or, or do you use, use it for personal? No, no, use, no, no. You I just use it for promo, that. right? I, I, I was cast in a CBC miniseries about six years ago, and they said, uh, you need to have a, a Twitter account. They forced me to set it up. And, you know, I, ever since then, the only time I ever use it is, like you said, to let people know that something's coming out. What would it take? I don't know. I mean, it's it's clear, it's evidence that social media can help you market your product or your project. I know that to be true. I also know that you could put a lot of out time and energy and hours and money and manpower into a social media marketing campaign, and it doesn't work. Um, so, so I also know that that's it's hit and miss there as well. Uh, I. I, it's hard to say. I don't think there's anything that would get me hooked on social media. I'm trying to find other ways to do this. I mean, even if Facebook I, I, were know. to change its name for you, if Facebook were to change its name <laughs> to say Meta, wow, that would yeah, be, maybe I would get involved. I wonder if that could ever possibly happen. All right, we'll have to just uh, we'll have to you know you're, wait. You're dating us. You're dating the date of the yeah. of the recording of this po- <laughs> of this podcast. What kind of advice do you got? For somebody who wants to get into the movie making game as an actor, as a writer, as a director, what would you say to somebody who's just starting out? Well, first I'd say, is there anything else that you like doing that you're good at? <laughs> because you should just do that. Have you considered medical school? Maybe yeah. Law school. Say, <laughs> you have to really, you have to really love it. And you have to really, it has to really be the only thing that you can or want to do. Because you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer through it. You're going to deal with enormous amounts of rejection, doors slamming in your face, people telling you no. And you have to want it so badly that you are willing to put up with that, that you're willing to uh, push through all of that to get where you want to be. Um, and and it, I, that's what it comes down to, the drive and desire. If you have, if you have a little bit of talent, that helps too. Um, I've never stopped studying. I still take, I still go to acting class. Every I Saturday? still work with a, <laughs> not every Saturday. <laughs> no, new one, but I still work with an acting coach on big projects. I still, you know, read, um, you know, books about acting and screenwriting. So I think training and studying and keeping yourself sharp is important. My biggest advice is if you want to break into the, if you're in Canada and you want to break into the Canadian film and TV business, educate yourself on this industry. So many of the younger people that I talk to who are trying to break in, I say to them, so wh- who are your favorite Canadian uh, film directors? And they, they they can name one or two. And I say, well, what was the best Canadian movie you saw last year? And they don't know because I didn't see any, or they don't know if they're Canadian. Or what's your favorite Canadian TV show? And they don't know any. Well, why, how could you, if that's like a, that's like a, a, a doctor not, not reading the medical journals or not know, like a science, an, a, you know, a, a space uh, expert not knowing the latest, you know, you, you, how can you not dive in? And there's so much great stuff being made in our country. Know the names, know who the producers are, know who the directors are, familiarize yourself with their work so that when you're in finally in a room with them or someone who, a colleague of theirs, you know what you're talking about and you can be a part of the conversation. No one's going to want to work with you if you don't, if you know nothing about Canadian film and TV. Um, so that's my biggest piece of advice. I think this is a redundant question, but you know, where can people find out a little bit more about you? Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. I, I would. I, I keep. I would keep the. I keep the website pretty uh, updated. So you can go to jonaschernick dot com. Uh, you can also go to my film. My production company is called Banana Moon Sky Films. So you can go check out banana moon sky films dot com. Uh, if you punch my name into your Netflix search or your iTunes search. You get a list of stuff that I've made, other acting in, or, uh, you know, I've got a film on a film on Netflix right now that I wrote, produced, and, and acted in, and you can check that out. It's called My Awkward Sexual Adventure. Uh, it's funny, I think. 
Yeah, but don't look don't look for me on social media. You'll come up short. Perfect. Well, thank you for being on the show and sharing with us how you make a living. My great pleasure. I appreciate it. And thanks for having me. And you're doing a great thing here. So keep it up. Subscribe to Making a Living Show on Apple, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, and pretty much anywhere else you get your podcasts. For more on the show, visit makingalivingshow.com and follow along on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Making a Living Show is produced by Next Exit Media and hosted by me, Roby Levy. Thanks for listening.